And welcome once again to the weekly MetaView Salon, where we explore issues of politics and technology, culture and policy, uh, largely so we can understand them, but also so that we might uh, uh, explore them in an interdisciplinary, if not interesting and entertaining way for the benefits of everybody and anybody who might want to join the conversation. Now, uh, today's session, I'm, I'm really quite pleased to say, was partly, uh, 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 not partly, entirely inspired and triggered by MetaView's member Vasiliki Bednar, who also publishes Regs to Riches, uh, which is a fantastic newsletter. And uh, we really felt, or Vas felt, and I fundamentally agreed that responsible innovation is a good entree to some of the many issues that we cover, both respectively in our publications, but I think as a broader community as a whole. And, uh, you know, Vast, before I turn it over to you, I, I kind of felt that responsible innovation is it's like one of those words that you show up at a conference and all of a sudden it's the theme and the keynote and all the panels and all the sessions. Everyone's talking about responsible innovation because that was almost the experience I had when you shared it with me that I sort of realized, hey, wait a minute, everybody's talking about responsible innovation. And it was almost as if it was new to me, as if as, as a concept, while the substance of it is very familiar, as a phrase, I, I still kind of found it novel and foreign. So I'm curious to have you start us off as you see fit in terms of where this conversation goes, but maybe satisfy my own curiosity in terms of uh, where did you or how did you encounter the, the concept of responsible innovation? you know in the in the in the private sector working at startups at technology companies I was more like responsible innovation question mark like what would that mean for us in that context what does it look like is it more than just you know compliance right and kind of meeting those basic thresholds so that what a company on the outside is doing is you know you know the kind of bar we have is kind of like is it legal <laughs> right but I think responsible innovation is about so much more. So I got excited that more people were studying it, building communities around it. And I also have found just from the kind of crowdsourcing of readings or opportunities, you know, job opportunities, actors in the space, it seems like a very inclusive, thoughtful community, which makes it fascinating, but brings me back to the you know, what is this thing? How do we recognize it? Do is and is the best way to recognize it just through those examples by pointing to uh, case studies, by pointing to policy interactions that that let us say, hey, that's responsible innovation on behalf of a company. But also, as, as you and I wrote about and don't worry, we're not going to kind of litigate the post by any means. You know, what does responsible innovation mean for a policymaker, for regulators? You know what's their what's their duty or opportunity in terms of not just defining the space but facilitating it and that kind of got me excited and i think it's just the nicest thing to talk about at a at an online salon as we chat on our screens and please feel free to again light it up in the chat feature i often chat probably too much when i'm in a group setting because an idea comes to mind and i just kind of need to get it out or put it somewhere but don't feel that you'll be distracting us and I'm looking forward to hearing your reactions and conceptions and kind of what what it would mean to you and, and how we can do a better job uh, again I'll wrap in a second but how we can do a better job equipping people that want to re responsibly innovate I do think it's an aspiration that many entrepreneurs do genuinely share with government but are comparatively you know under resourced in terms of clarifying what that pathway looks like or how how they'll know that's something they've achieved and is worth talking about or even describing. Well, and, and let me quickly reiterate your invitation for people to use the chat because I think it also helps us guide the conversation and know when to throw you and put you on the hot seat on camera. But my initial reaction to responsible innovation was to evoke both organic and design thinking. 
and and both you know organics have their pluses and minus on the one hand you know organic is a premium produce at the grocery store and it's a way to encourage agriculture to have different or better practices but it can also be entirely meaningless and and there's been a lot of scandals in the organic world as to uh, you know uh, agriculture producers claiming they're organic when they're not and undermining the marketplace as a whole and design thinking is similar. That design thinking as a way of being inclusive and empathic is a, is a fantastic concept, but it can be easily watered down as to be kind of meaningless and, and to not really envelop the, the, the true purpose of, of, of inclusivity and, and empathy in terms of a business product or in terms of an organization's mission. So I, I kind of have the same hope, but also the same skepticism that I see tremendous potential for responsible innovation, creating a culture that helps people and more importantly, organizations do the right thing. But I also fear that it could be watered down that, you know, like AI ethics, it could be used as an excuse to just do the stuff you were going to do anyway but have a kind of feel good that you've consulted the right people about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, look, I think if it becomes kind of uh, softened, if it becomes a sticker or like a pseudo credential, then that's actually kind of dangerous for the space. Um, I think someone essentially brought up this point on Twitter yesterday, Sean McDonald, someone I'm often learning from and with. Um, and he really made me think, you know, is responsible, is what we're really talking about with responsible innovation, innovation that can be sufficiently governed, right? Is it about the role for, for democratic governance interacting in some way and kind of holding companies accountable so that we're doing better than that shareholder model, which puts, you know, that fiduciary responsibility in direct, uh, often in direct uh, uh, tension with the public interest. Um, which really got me thinking too, and I'd, I'd be curious um, if that if that res if that generates any response. I mean, I'm, I'm seeing a couple of things in the comments. John, great point about that Brookings Institute paper. Maybe we can we can flip it in there. It, it also strikes me, um, and this is a bad habit I have in, in Rex to Riches, and probably in my life as well. Um, but it strikes me that the thinking space on responsible innovation is comparatively underdeveloped in Canada, which is actually fine. Like in this, in the scheme of things, it's, it's fine. We can borrow and build and that's what we do as Canadians. But at the same time, we have these amazing opportunities to learn from the companies that we're trying to grow in our own backyard and understand, do our regulatory realities suit what these companies are doing? And whose failure is that? Like it often comes down to that, I think, when we're evaluating responsible innovation. Is it the company that's doing something new that's undefined from a legislative perspective? Should they always be demonized? Or can we also point to that regulatory lag and say, wow, there's something about our governance institutions where we are always catching up or you know, just falling behind that hurts both the entrepreneurship and innovation, but also just hurts people and consumers. I feel like I'm talking too much and I need to mute myself. No, but I, I think you're you're establishing the context, I think, quite effectively, as well as the opportunity. Because I almost thought, you know, on the level of PR and spin, if mm -hmm. this help makes regulation more palatable, more debatable as, as a normalized concept, that in and itself is a win. But Angelo, do you, do you want to come in and share your comments about your, your suspicions of the PR element or the PR speak to the responsible innovation phrase? Uh, I wasn't expecting for you to put me on the spot like this, <laughs> um, but uh, you know, I was I, I I had put in some money into um, investments um, last year, um, and uh, there was a whole thing about you know um, investing, making sure you're not investing in oil and gas or you know a particular industry that you're not um, you know a supporter of, and um, you know I I, I generally believe in that idea um but there's for me a certain skepticism especially when you start talking about um other extractive in extractive resource industries so I, I think a lot about um the oil and gas industry and mining and fracking and they 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 just slap the, the word responsible in front of it and then all of a sudden it's it's better or or you know like we're, we're supposed to be more comfortable with the idea of it um and so you know 
I, I, I'm, I'm engaging in this conversation about responsible, um, responsible innovation, but I'm, you know, definitely skeptical about like all of the times that PR throws the word responsible in front of something, and then we're supposed to feel better about it. Well, and, and, and I think there is a double edged sword to that, because on the one hand, there's absolutely a ton of spin loaded to this phrase. But maybe there's some psychological effect that's positive. That's an after effect to that. Now, we've got two hands up, which I obviously have to reward. But Robin, I, I quickly want to throw to you because you made a, a comment in the chat that I, I feel also sets the context really quite effectively. If you might make that verbally and then I'll come to Sharita and then Brent. Yeah, well, I've thought about, um, I've, yeah, I've thought about innovation in the fintech space and something that I've been fascinated by is the idea of like the regulatory sandbox. So yeah. this idea that the regulator uh, and the business work together to, you know, for temporarily loosen the rules, explore how an innovation could be implemented in the market and then work together to make a regulation that works. And yeah. like on the one hand, it sounds like such an interesting model. And I think if you have a responsible innovator, I think that could work really well. But how do we ensure that the innovator is themselves responsible, right? Like, yeah. you know, exception can be really powerful and can you know lead to really interesting outcomes but how do we manage those exceptions in a way that's fair yeah i mean one quick thing about sandboxes i like the os the ontario securities commission sandbox too but i think the like the relationship between the regulator and innovators is such that innovators have to apply to be admitted to the sandbox it should be the other way around a true regulatory sandbox would invite companies join us this is a safe place it is a play space it's not to get government on your butt we want to see you succeed you're doing something different we want to figure it out um that's a way i would love to see the model expanded and another kind of related model to sandboxes hang on I'll, i'm gonna have to look it up in my notes is um an anticipator mm -hmm. if anyone's heard of this um anyway People have their hands up, so I'm going to look for my anticipator link and drop it into the chat too. But I sure. love that point, Robin. Sharita, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I do. Um, probably from around 2003 to about 2015, I was involved with two major research projects. One of them had to do with responsible return on investment for union pension funds. And so because of that, I took a good look at the whole idea of fiduciary responsibility, return on investment, the regulations around that, or basically the lack of regulations, and who was um, powering this discussion. Um, a little later in that um, 12 years, um, I also ran a project on um, socially responsible economy, which had to do with social businesses. And social businesses could be online, could be offline. It, it really doesn't matter. It's really a definition. And what I came across, um, first of all, was... Um, a lot of companies saying, or a lot of organizations saying that they were part of the social economy. As a matter of fact, people were talking about Airbnb and Uber being part of the social economy, et cetera, when actually they're not, according to the definition. But what I found was a lot of people jumping on the bandwagon so that they could look good, right? And as a matter of fact, there were more people jumping on the bandwagon so they could look good than there were actually people in the field trying to really work on this. Perhaps the most frightening thing for me was one time um, I was in Ottawa and 
um, we were working on some, we were working, the government invited us so that we could work with them on the beginnings of the regulations in terms of the social economy. And the thing that really scared me was the government was so happy to look at the economy part of it, to look at how nonprofits that work with marginalized people um, could make money. And they were happy about it because then they wouldn't have to give any money to nonprofits. Um, in working with nonprofits, um, you know, doing the research, there were a few nonprofits who completely backed off the whole idea of social return on investment because there's no way to measure it. And the measurement is totally, absolutely personal to that particular, um, you know, people who are involved there. So first of all, when I hear regulation about this stuff, immediately that government example jumps to my mind and I go, whoa, I don't want any, anywhere near this. Um, and then I think about the people who were really trying to do this in the field, really trying to do it right, were actually um, punished for doing it in that way. They were not rewarded. So it makes me you know, very suspicious when I begin to look at things like innovation, good innovation, social entrepreneurship, true social entrepreneurship, and then regulation. For me, it should be the people who are on the ground that make the regulation and they need to develop their own power in being able to police that area. Um, I would really prefer the government get out of the business. Well, and, and let's not get into the, we want government out of the business of government because that's a meta view which does come up regularly. And Brent, I'm about to throw to you, but Michelle, I because of some of the stuff you're posting in chat, I'm curious if you'd be comfortable following Brent, especially given Charita's uh, comments about the role of kind of the a small C civil society in general. Brent, go ahead. Um, yeah, so so I had more of, I guess, a question for everybody, um, which is sort of on a, a small case study. So um, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of us in this group that uh, that you signal and enjoy it as our encrypted point-to-point uh, -point messaging app. Um, and now we're seeing some former employees raise concerns that the way that the product is being developed and scaling uh, may not make it, let's say, super robust to not being used by uh, poor actors. Um, and, and I guess this is my question. So like my policy thinking brain is just, I think I'm realizing I'm just like so unsuited to things that are pervasive and scalable. Um, so like both if you were uh, Signal's head, uh, which I Moxie Marlin Spike, is it? I think was the was the name. Yeah, which is just delightful. Um, but both, you know, what do you do in that situation? And then I guess the bigger question is even considering the entire toolkit available to governments, not just regulation, but like moral suasion in our entire uh, arsenal. Like, what what would even be possible to do? Putting aside political feasibility, anything to shape that in a way that we consider responsible considering that the structures of signal are set up like in the best case scenario right you've got this bankroll nonprofit. like uh, what even could yeah could be done i mean i'll quickly jump in and say best case scenario to date because the nature of cybersecurity is every threat provokes a new way of thinking of how to mitigate against it and, you know, this may be the moment in which decentralized social media starts to rise because right across the political spectrum, people are saying maybe there's a reason to have secure 
uh, technological alternatives that are resistant to external pressure, whether state or corporate or whatever. There's pluses and minuses to that entire discussion that I think is a bit of a tangent, but for sure speaks to responsible innovation and the idea that it's underpinned by trust as, as a concept as a whole. Vast, did you want a, a hot pursuit on that subject or shall we throw to Michelle? Okay, yeah, go ahead. Tiny hot pursuit. I mean, I like that question and I don't have a good answer. But I like the thought experiment and I actually just wanted to say two things. One, like this is a great way to prime ourselves when we're reading the news and thinking of those examples of like, what would you do or what should they do? Like, what is your advice as a, as a, as a person, maybe as a pol person interested in policy stuff? I mean, I, I do want to point to the example of um, Facebook via WhatsApp being really clear about the pending updates to their privacy policy, which sent people fleeing to, to Telegram and Signal. And there is, there is a universe where you can look at that and say, that is a really good example of disclosure and a privacy policy and, and almost an instance of responsible innovation because they're being so clear with what they will do with the data in the future. It was annoying. It's disappointing to many people. And they've since, I think, put that on ice or reversed course. Um, so, you know, I bring that up only because you can have a disappointing policy pathway, but that I think is communicated responsibly. And that's worth thinking about and understanding too. Um, but Michelle, we've been, we've been pointing to you and then jumping in front of you in the queue to speak. So I mute myself again. Yeah, no, not at all. I mean, I, I, I arrived today because I've been so inspired by that's your framing uh, uh, around these issues. And, you know, I think the the there's like tension, there's clear and ever present tensions here. I mean, we think about the sort of revolving door between industry and government and the you know, the sort of lobbying that's come to characterize a lot of those relationships. And then, of course, the way that government is procuring technology effectively is privatizing a lot of public service delivery. I feel like this, you know, this, <laughs> there's something key in this, whether you're calling it responsible innovation or public interest technology or, or whatever you, whatever the framing is, there's something there that I think, I mean, we've been talking of, I, I work at Ford Foundation, we've been talking about the evolving door where it's like putting these values at the center is actually the intervention that then, you know, can, can, can be at the center of new guardrails and guidelines and relationships and um and and talent pipelines between industry and government and civil society that could actually you know lead us toward a much more productive place where 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 actually the, every stakeholder is committed to upholding you know democratic norms and public interest values like equity and transparency and accountability you know even at the expense of things like profit and neoliberal efficiency etc cetera, etc cetera. if like that's that's to us feeling like an important intervention and then it becomes about like how do we operationalize that you know within government agencies how do we operationalize that within civil society civil society is the farthest along clearly i'd say private sector is you know, very late to the game and just starting to think, you know, you've, you've got companies that are now thinking like, oh, well, actually a better regulated marketplace would be a better and more sustainable place for us to compete. So there's, it feels like we're at a moment now across a lot of these sectors where we're ready to have that conversation. And so that's exciting from our perspective, but to everybody's point here, you know, there's still a lot of tension to navigate and that you, what you don't want is like kind of the checklist or the check the box and that then you can say, well, I'm a responsible innovator. So I'm now, you know, free from the, the, the specter of regulatory oversight or, you know, nobody can come for me. Um, actually, we need to, you know, that we need to take the transparency piece seriously we need to um we need to think about public you know public input and 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 really elevating the expertise of people with lived experience most impacted populations like those things need to be codified um it's not enough to say well we're using design thinking or we're using human-centered design like actually it's clear that that's you know that that necessary but not at all sufficient um mm -hmm. to ensure that these values are, are really being prioritized across the life cycle of how technology is designed and deployed and maintained um in the public sector and beyond well and and, and that's where i i myself see this as a legitimate opportunity even if the road is paved with all sorts of empty promises and trojan horses that have preceded it 
And it, it's partly because even before the pandemic, there is a shift in how we thought of technology companies and thought of the need to regulate technology companies. I think the pandemic has accentuated that because we are now so, you know, dependent upon the Internet, dependent upon so many of these platforms. But then I also think we're seeing a political shift, not just the administration in the White House changing, but globally, there is a greater appetite, not just around responsible innovation and responsible technology, but mm. collaborating across governments, collaborating across jurisdictions, where previously it was like everyone suspiciously watching each other. Now it's much more a, a, of an honest, hey, we got to work together. And, and that's where I, I personally spent the last two days thinking about the solar winds hack and, and thinking about the scale of the hack, both in terms of how it's uh, a thoroughly undermine the U.S. government technology infrastructure. I mean, you know, the 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 change from Trump to Biden, of course, is big news. But the solar wind hack is huge because government as we know it, digital government as we know it, is thoroughly compromised in part because of the the role of the private sector. So those of us who have been arguing that the, the public infrastructure, the public sector should be championing this, we got an opportunity now. He's saying, hey, there you go. That's what happens when you rely upon outsourced, outsourced, outsourced IT infrastructure. I digress, but th this is a huge pivot historically and, and technologically. And that's why I think responsible innovation is, is not just relevant, but is right. As, as a rallying point for people to say there's a better way in which we can use technology, not just in the public sector, but across society as a whole. And, and I think that is an opportunity we should be seizing upon. But here's where it could all fall apart, right? We're in a little bit of a snow globe right now. Things are paused. We are, you know, trying to work on our vaccination plans. And soon we'll start to hear more about our economic recovery plans it's very likely that many economies will be broadly appealing to our ability to innovate our way out of this. And that means we're going to be supportive of throwing spaghetti at the wall, which does, you know, support arguments against stricter regulations. The, the appetite, Jesse, that you point to, you know, pre-pandemic too, I think it's popular, again, for us, most of us in a Canadian context, you know, to want to flex at big tech, like, oh yeah, we got some digital taxation in the works. Oh, as soon as the OECD does something, you know, oh yeah, we're gonna figure that out pretty soon. Just you wait and see, because we're not as attuned to the kind of big tech challenges on our own backyard. Um, I also wanted to point to, you know, Airbnb and Uber came up and I think they've, Jesse and I said this in the piece, but they've come to color our perception of the relationship between tech companies and governments, perhaps too much. Right? Like, yes, they capture this moment in time of aggressive regulatory entrepreneurship. Um, but I think governments around the world have learned so much from that. And I think it kind of has put a fire under our policymaking butts to respond quickly and more thoughtfully to emergent technologies before, mm -hmm. you know, it shouldn't take, I'm sitting here in Toronto, we're just starting to regulate Airbnb. This is 12, 13 years after the company started. That's not a policy success, right? Mm -hmm. that's, a mm -hmm. that's a government failure at the end of the day. So, Brian, you've got your hand up. And, John, I want to bring you into the conversation after because you've been saying some great stuff in chat that I, I want to get you to say on stream. But, Brian, by all means, jump in. Uh, yeah, I just like after you mentioned the, the Solar Winds podcast, it, I was listening this morning to uh, Decoder from The Verge. Yeah, and he interviewed about this uh, someone about the solar winds um, hack, and and everyone thinks it's about a company in control of so many different things, but it's actually the fact that it's a small company, and um, like he was, they were mentioned, he was mentioning how Microsoft, you know, like back in the early two thousands, everyone was looking at Microsoft. It's like you hack Microsoft, and it's like you control you know, computers around the world. And now it's like there's this small company, SolarWinds, but at the same time, even though they're small, they're connected to all of these other uh, different elements. You know? Yeah. Yeah, they're the linchpin, right? That, you know, normal people wouldn't have the time to figure out, but the FSB or the GRU just happen to be resourced to do that type of sleuthing and sourcing. It's almost straight out of science fiction. But John, I'm, I'm curious, you've been uh, posting a bunch of stuff in the chat. 
Where, where do you see this, the role of this responsible innovation stuff, either as a substantive framework or maybe a distraction from a real opportunities? I think it's both. Like, like any good shell game, there's a potential truth hidden underneath each one of those shells. Uh, you have people that are very preoccupied with both sides of the problem, but they're still not talking together. Uh, and until we get every stake involved, we're not going to be able to identify and elucidate what the problems are that are going to matter to everybody. And um, then we're going to be reinvesting the we reinventing the wheel every time there's a new problem. It's only when you get everybody at the table, the the government, the stakeholders in business, and the people who are the vampiric lifeblood of big data that we're going to get this kind of thing sorted out. There's an Israeli company that quite legally can uh, sell uh, software to hack and unlock your iPhone. But that is wonderful for law and order fans. But how does that affect the next generation of hackers? And getting rid of encryption by weakening it but only the government will be allowed to handle it, uh, so the slogan goes, will eventually come out like any good Pandora's box. So we need to really expand our circle of who's at the table to get to the answers that really are going to matter down the road. Well, and, and that's where the inclusivity part, I think, is essential. And it's given in lip service, but it's to use a phrase that is often part of this world. It does, They haven't scaled it up. Right. That's part of the issue Facebook is dealing with is, you know, they scaled up faster than they could manage and now they can't manage the platform. I mean, all, all of this, uh, unfortunately, comes with it. Uh, if only we could go back like nostalgia to me always plagues a lot of policy and regulation discussions. And nostalgia is always so problematic when it comes to technology, because the moment you evoke nostalgia, the technology's already moved forward even further. And part of it is about regulatory capacity. Part of it is how do we, you know, create the responsiveness? How do we create the awareness so that we can address these problems as they happen? It's why I like the sandbox concept. It's why I like, you know, in uh, the government inviting companies to collaborate and find, you know, a, a mutually beneficial uh, rules and regulations that benefit the company, that benefit society. But I kind of feel that all of this is theory, that this is where we come back to our usual cognitive bias of where the folks who kind of agree and get it, you know, how does this scale up? Although for the record, we've got what? A 100% growth rate on our salon participation? I mean, that's pretty good. Zoom can't handle us as we go further, but Discord could probably get us to a couple of more factors that we will entertain if possible. Vass, you've got your hand up by all means. Bail me out here. I'd like to buy a bow. Um, you know, it could still be worth like LARPing 2009, right? Like, I we have so, we do have a lot to learn from these last like 20, 21 years. And I, I do find it fun to think about this is another good device, just like Brett's like, what do you do if you work at Signal and you want to be, you know, doing the best possible job? what should have happened in 2009 that didn't? What is the role of journalism? There's been academic uh, literature on how journalism coverage of technology, you know, lacked the kind of criticalness, uh, mm -hmm. I'm not being articulate, that, you know, maybe we needed, that we were very celebratory and, and observing. You know, what is the role for universities? Are universities going to emerge as a neutral play space that should host regulatory sandboxes mm -hmm. and reflect that back to government, you know, be a place where government's convening. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say, I, I like that. And you're right, the technology changes, but the mechanisms that catalyze our response also need to evolve. And, I, you know, I don't want to out anyone on the chat, but Brent, I know you've done a lot of work with CIFAR and CIFAR is a great example of the convening power of a Canadian institution that's, you know, research intense, but also very consultative with a range of groups. Consul consultative is one of the words I can read, but not say. But other people have their hands up. I'm going back on mute, back to the chat. Well, the host uh, recognizes the member of Beaches East York. You had your hand up, sir? <laughs> I do, although no need to be so formal. You can call me Nate. Um, I guess... Uh, I'm very. I, I thanks for hosting this. I uh, I saw it on Twitter and uh, found uh, some time in my schedule, and I really appreciate uh, joining. And 
mainly listening in. I guess uh, the challenge, as I think through the notion of responsible innovation, you start from the premise of responsible to who, right? Because there are lots of different, you, whether it's customers, consumers, and I think of that through a privacy lens uh, in, in the case of some tech, but employees, obviously, and there's disruption to employees and, and basic labor standards in many cases, the mm -hmm. environment, general public in terms of, you know, and, and different negative externalities depending upon the product that we are talking about. So I, I think it's, it's hard when we talk about at a general level responsible innovation instead of saying responsible to who. And then once we identify how we want that responsibility to look like, then we can start to say, what are the solutions? And sometimes the solutions are internalizing costs on the companies, imposing some sort of maybe new regulation, maybe co-developed if, if it's a positive product. I mean, uh, I saw a note about um, uh, in vitro cell-based meat. There's an example of you would want to take a tech and say, how do we actually develop this tech? Because it is going to compete with something that isn't so very responsible that we want to oust from the marketplace. So mm -hmm. I, it, like mm -hmm. as, as responsible innovation itself is, is such a big category for someone like in my shoes, I would almost want to, you know, you almost want to go bit by bit to say, okay, in this particular category of innovation, what is the responsible to who, what is the problem we're wanting to address and what are the tools maybe at our disposal? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's where the responsible to whom is so vague because it's different when it's fiduciary duty. It's different when it's public interest. And I think it's also different when it's users, right? And the relationship between a platform and its users and all those different types of constituency relationships are not always clearly defined. And that's where I think responsible innovation is an opportunity for platforms, for governments to use it as a way to define those relationships and, and earn those trusts. Now, a Angelo, um, by all means, you've been also posting some good stuff in the chat. Join us here in the, the, the discussion. Yeah, thanks. Um, first of all, it's pretty cool that Nate's on here because I'm a big fanboy. Um, but shout out to him. Um, what I wanted to say is that there, I, I, I like this discussion about who's at the table and bringing the stakeholders together at the table and and everything. And I think in theory, that's that's important. Um, and I'm, I'm a big fan of it. I think I think it's a good idea. But then the question becomes, you know, how does the influence the dynamic work in in those councils, those committees, those tables? Um, <clears throat> when I think about the new Biden tech advisory council, whatever he's he's putting together, how much influence do those tech companies actually have on the policy? Or will the government side regulators be strong enough to push back when when they need to? Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's a sense where you, you can you can get too cozied up together um, and that governments just sort of, you know, follow on the the lead of um, of the private sector. I think also, you know, for example, I, I'm interested in music city policy. And in Toronto, we have a music advisory council. Um, and, uh, and, and often, you know, they're, they're trying to bring all the stakeholders together. They're trying to bring the public sector, musicians, live music venue owners, all of these stakeholders together. Um, but then we still have developments that are taking down places like Sneaky Dees. Mm -hmm. um, so how much does the private sector actually have influence at these tables? When we think about how good we, we, we always talk about this and we talk about like bring everybody to, together at the table and being responsible in that way, how much are we willing to give up? Well, and, and to what extent are you creating false expectations? Right, that that's one of the byproducts of, of consultations in general is that it creates the perception you have a voice, it creates the perception you have agency, and, and you still might not get the decision you desire. And so, Jeanette, I, I kind of want to bring you in here, partly because I was talking to someone yesterday and we were talking about the role of having a dissenter, or the role of having a critic, and you kind of jumped in mine. And I, I'm curious for you to address what Angelo was just talking about, that there's often a perception when, you know, companies and government are too close together, are coordinating too closely that, you know, there's many people who are just going to reject that altogether. Oh, that's corrupt. Oh, you know, they're in cahoots. 
And we do now live in a kind of conspiracy culture in which people by default are going to assume the worst of government or assume the worst of corporations. So as, as you, as someone who believes in participatory democracy, as someone who believes in the idea of inclusivity and accessibility, how do you balance off the need to get everyone at the table and the perception, especially amongst those who, for whatever reason, feel left out, that it's all a conspiracy, that it's all, you know, crooked? You know, how are those perspectives balanced off? Not, not to throw you a hardball, but <laughs> I kind of feel this is right up your, your alley. Uh, well, I, you know, ever since Sharita mentioned this, this idea of uh, those who are trying to do the right thing being punished for it, uh, I keep thinking about this, I mean, it was really throughout this entire conversation, but this truism from biology that in the game of life, uh, selfish individuals win, but altruistic groups win more, right? And, it, and that, that's kind of the paradox there that, um, yeah, if it's everyone for themselves, there is no incentive to do the right thing. Um, but the power of the group, the power of collaboration is always more powerful. And I think that's the counter to, oh, it's a conspiracy, they're in cahoots, it's collusion. Well, you know, yeah, that's one way to look at collaboration. Um, and there, it's good to be skeptical, obviously, uh, always, but um, there are just things that uh, collaboration can accomplish that, uh, you know, are otherwise not possible. So that's, that's kind of where I would come from. David, uh, you want to jump in at this part of the conversation, if only because I, I feel that you could follow up from Jeanette's remarks quite effectively. Um, uh, Not to I, put I've you on the spot. Or about, um, I've been thinking about some of the things that people have said on, about the, you know, the, the meaning of the concept of the construct of responsible innovation, like responsible to whom and uh, innovation, in, 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 you know, in, it seems as if we're, we seem to be talking about innovation in technology terms, and I'm, you know, I'm, th I'm thinking about other kinds of innovation, and I'm, I'm I'm wondering if if the construct is insufficiently specified, and mm -hmm. if it is, then it will kind of fade away, like most insufficiently specified constructs <laughs> constructs constructs do. There are some things that I I. You know, the, the idea of regulation as enabling rather than policing, I thought that was, an, you know, a really interesting, interesting point. Some of the language is, is um, interesting, like pipelines and regulatory lag, lag and actors in this space and, you know, all these concepts that are, uh, for a lot of people, would require explanation, uh, you know, I would think. But I was wondering about... Um, what what examples of responsible innovation are there? Where would I, if I wanted to see a responsible innovation, what would I, what would I look at? And and um, I, I suspect that there there probably isn't one, but there may be several, you know, many perhaps innovations that have gone along that path of responsible innovation, and um, and of, of you know have had relatively relative degrees of success and what was it about that and what was it about the um the uh, the reasons for them not achieving the the innovative capabilities that had been dreamt of in the beginning and then i'm wondering if there are you know are there existing guidelines are there frameworks that can allow innovators to um and, and I'll finish that sentence. Guidelines are, or, and frameworks that, in, that could guide innovators in, in, into you know, increasing the responsibility, to use our current term, uh, of the uh, innovation, uh, of the innovation that we're that we're making. And then I'm thinking about innovations that weren't ter terribly responsible, and uh, but were you know thoroughly uh, successful. And what is the difference between you know uh, irresponsible innovation that have been successful and responsible innovations that haven't? So more than more, just thinking about the th things that you guys have been talking about is 
been reverberating in my brain. So, I mean, Brent had his hand up, but I think he uh, put it down, if only to defer to you, Vass, because that very much felt like uh, a, an excellent setup, especially the case examples. Because m- my feel in, in, you know, sort of doing the, the essay we did in prep for this, that there is a graduate seminar here in terms of looking at these case examples and measuring them within the questions that David has asked and as many of the other issues of our you know, fellow travelers here today. Well, I know someone who's trying to build a case study course at the graduate level on some of these things. And look, I'm only half joking by typing about period panties in the chat. But again, I think it's so important to look at Canadian companies and get those little case studies and think about them. So, and, and assume that nobody knows what period panties are. So please enlighten us. You guys Google it while I talk about it. Uh, Canadian company Nix, K-N-I-X, super successful, has actually never taken private funding. Um, came up with an innovative product that essentially has builds in an absorbent kind of panty liner to the like truss of women's underwear. And because it's, um, you know, it's, it's popular with women postpartum, um, et cetera, et cetera. Now, as the company grows, there's more and more copycats. And this is fundamentally like, I don't know, a bunch of different chemicals uh, at a very porous uh, area of a, of a woman's body. So Nix started a campaign last year, pre-pandemic. Uh, they had a scientific paper as well, was on change.org. And they were saying, regulate period panties. And I think it's fascinating because it's a leading firm asking for government regulation, identifying a gap in the space, but also saying like, we created something new and we want to see either standards, right? Standard set, um, research kind of, you know, what's the optimal kind of composition of these things so that they aren't harmful for people. And they published research that suggested certain, you know, the use of certain chemicals that some, frankly, competitors were using uh, were cancer causing. And I, I love it as a case study because it's a company pushing for something. There are clear competitive advantages for the company as well. It's in their business interest, um, but it also potentially sets a different threshold And it can point us back to that relationship between innovators and government and say, you know, oh, is Nix bad? Is Nix bad because they created this new product and they didn't tell government about it or ask about it? Or is is government asleep at the wheel? You know, this is a popular new thing that people are purchasing. It's out in the market. It's available for purchase. And, And how do you facilitate those relationships? How do you talk about innovative textiles and what standards we even want and like what the regulatory environment should be. Back to you guys, Brent, you're back. Did you know what period panties were? Uh, I've heard the phrase before, yeah. So I wouldn't think of that as a a responsible innovation piece because I feel like the mechanisms, and this is sort of related to the question I was gonna pose to people, is that, you know, there's a long body of consumer protection and presumably depending on the size of the competitors, I mean, you've got, you know, remedy through litigation if there is proven to be, um, uh, you know, if there are harms. So the question I was going to ask was like, why are we having this conversation? Why does this phrase exist now? Like what's different about the current world that, you know, we've talked about consumer protection for many, many decades and environmental harms and externalities. And is it because there are the, I mean, the only thing I can kind of come up with is that there's, I guess, almost like more fuzzy harms that aren't in a way that, you know, we're really used to, you were exposed to some sort of harmful chemical. Um, We recognize that as a harm in a way that maybe in this technology space there are kind of these yeah and part of it is probably yeah is that it's you literally it doesn't apply in the case of free products so uh yeah i just don't know like what's i i think it's also the you know i don't want to get too off track but i think there is an exponential nature to the world that we live in and it's true of how quickly these institutions that today we take for granted right alphabet Google, Amazon, almost didn't exist 20 years ago. And so we're also anticipating what the next wave of innovation could unleash. 
you know, I, I, I think responsible innovation is partly meant to be permission to experiment, permission to scale, permission to entertain the unknown and uncertainty in an era of exponential technological growth. And I think that's why it's both deliberately vague, but also potentially powerful in terms of how it evokes. But I, I, I feel I'm digressing. You know, Nate, you have your hand up. I'm, I, I'll throw to you, but I, we can come back to this if, if people feel it's, it's worth exploring. Go ahead, Nate. I was just going to say it's interesting when we were talking about responsible innovation, and it's probably because I, I've been uh, I'm biased with a, a wife who is a nutrition professor and chef. But I immediately went to when we look at different industries that we participate in as consumers. I actually think the food that we buy and the, and the products that we buy, there is a, a clear sense as a consumer of this food can have a negative impact in this way. And so I'm going to try to choose this option instead in terms of the people making the food, in terms of the environmental impact. And it's interesting and how I, I, I guess this is the question, that, the conversation that, that you are grappling with in some senses, but I think it's a bit more challenging <laughs> because the, of the, the wide array of, of technology. But when I went to think of responsible tech, I, like, I was like, I don't know, does Wikipedia count? I, I, like, I don't know what examples count as far as it goes. Um, and, I, and I don't know, even know what the measurements are that I would judge other than this Facebook, I, I clearly see, you know, and I went down the rabbit hole of Cambridge Analytica on committee and I know the violations of privacy and I can see the negative impact they have on the discourse in relation to some of the deployment of, of their algorithm in the newsfeed. But like, I, you know, how am I judging that as a consumer versus other things? Whereas in some, in some industries, food being the obvious one for me, at least, there's a clear sense of as a consumer, this is ethical, this isn't. Yeah. And I'm not sure I would grant Wikipedia responsible innovations, innovator status, right? And, that, and that, that's a valid point. I think there's an inherent subjectivity to this. But at the same time, the traceability that we see happening in the agricultural sector, I, I think we would love to see that happen in the, in the technology world. And especially when it comes to algorithmic media to understand how the technology works and how it it changes. Because for me as a user, contrasting TikTok and Facebook is incredibly refreshing because I recognize that the algorithm is programmed or, or configured differently. I just wish I could do how. I wish that that was more transparent. And the same in terms of why Amazon shows the products it does or why Google shows the results it does. Angelo, you want to jump in? Yeah, um, I was just thinking, I mean, uh, those of us that are in Toronto, I don't know if, if uh, other people are outside of Toronto. Remember Sidewalk Labs? I mean, remember the neighborhood that that was so controversial? When we talk about responsible innovation, I think something like that needs to be discussed when we start thinking about things like smart neighborhoods where they control, they'll, they'll basically control every aspect of our life. And it, it, it touches upon many different communities. Um, and, and for me, especially, you know, marginalized communities um, being affected by, you know, fully, you know, tech um, neighborhoods like this. And one of the reasons I think the, the Sidewalk Labs, uh, Sidewalk Labs uh, project, you know, got scaled back or just, you know, really failed is because we didn't talk enough about responsible innovation. We didn't talk about how we can hold Alphabet um, responsible for these issues and say, and be proactive and say, you need to make sure that if you build a neighborhood like this, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do this, make sure that there are protections for um, all of these different communities and against the abuse of um, the, you know, possible, you know, issues with data. Um, I think Sidewalk Labs is a is a really interesting, uh, lead, you know, part of this because that I think is perhaps maybe a failure of the thinking of responsible innovation. But I, to your point, I would credit them with inspiring today's discussion, right? Sidewalk Labs was a poster child in not achieving their outcome, but in catalyzing public engagement, in catalyzing a policy debate, in, in, in fostering a policy literacy in this area that I am kind of, you know, grateful for, while also grateful that Sidewalk Labs didn't get their way and that they were not successful in having the kind of, uh, 
you know, policy conquest or, or public sector conquest that I think they were partly about. Um, I admit I've had trouble uh, following uh, some of the discussion going on in the chat because it's been happening at such a high rate. So Andre, do you mind if I pick on you and call you to jump into the discussion and share some of what you've posted in the chat here on the uh, uh, video discussion, as it were? Um, no, sure, happy to. Um, so I, I mean, I, I wouldn't say I have any any sort of coherent thoughts at this point, but I mean, just sort of a few observations. I mean, one thing that caught me was, or I will put it this way, my perspective, having spent some time working in government on, on these types of things and, and outside of government looking at them, is I, I less see some, some type of kind of malevolent interaction between tech or big tech and, and policymakers, regulators. My experience has more been that government simply doesn't have a lot of a lot of the the expertise or or the experience to be able to grapple with uh, the changes happening in the technology economy and, and to frankly keep up in terms of the, the governance regulatory sort of policy pieces um, and I think we've seen it on you know I've been this is like very uh, loose way of thinking about things but I see kind of the innovation policy stuff as the kind of the supportive side of things largely focused on technology um, and, and then, and then there's the whole kind of regulatory side that gets into the privacy issues or the antitrust issues or all, all these types of things. Um, and I, I don't feel like government's been able to keep up on either of them, frankly. So I think that says something, and I think it juxtaposes a little bit from the U.S., where there could, there's probably there's more money involved, more sort of potential for regulatory capture. Here, in a weird way, I almost feel like if there was the right kind of public interested. Um, you know, lever of a big tech company who would go in and act as a senior fellow in, in government and just help them help them through it, that, you know, that could be. And I, w one other observation, I like Brent's analogy about the, the, the poison in the river. Um, I think um, it's just that it took, it took generations before the, the trade-off between, you know, the economic benefits of the poison in the river and the, the environmental and public health implications were recognized and, and suddenly we put rules and regulations in place. So I guess, I guess there's that, but Jesse, to your point, um, it's just the pace, the pace now, the, the accelerated pace that I guess, you know, uh, demands answers quicker to some of these questions, I guess. Well, and, and okay, I, I'm about to add the disclaimer that I do not necessarily believe what I'm about to say. And in this case, I really don't believe what I'm about to say. But what if it was a, a com combination of like government consulting people from Facebook and people from Alphabet and people from Microsoft while also running a subreddit, while also running a Discord, right? While also, you know, like on the one hand, tapping into the corporate expertise but on the other hand, wading into the deep end of the social media swamps, for lack of a better word, and, and having that level of intense open consultation. And companies do that, not always successfully. I mean, Reddit AMAs are often a, a, a total clown show. But I, I do think that there needs, if, if we're talking about regulatory capacity, if we're talking about proficiency on behalf of the public sector, then I think there does need to be a kind of literacy building through fire, right? By literally going into the spaces, by, you know, having, uh, uh, you know, ministerial briefings on Twitch, right? Having... You know, and again, I, I I started this by saying I do not necessarily agree with this. I'm not certain that this is the best idea. But if we're going to go to the old trope of, you know, we need to bring in some expertise, which I do agree of, maybe we also need to do the dance that everyone else does on the Internet, which means some asshole is going to tell you you're an asshole and you need to reconcile what that means for the consultation or the project you're engaged in. Any thoughts? Anyone want to take that provocation and run with it in terms of, you know, to what extent when we say inclusive, to what extent when we say participatory, you know, what do we really mean by that? Angelo, you threw your hand up, so by all means. Unless your hand no, was already I don't, I don't have anything to say. I, I didn't throw my, I should have. John, please bail me out. Well, I'm not sure I've got a shovel that long, but... Um... <laughs> 
<laughs> it is interesting when you think about uh, corporations that uh, are responsible for products in a cradle to grave way. Um, policy and product development should be a more comprehensive plan. Like the GDPR, you and I have talked about this before, has allowed companies and entire industries to think about 20 years, a generation in the future, because they're not worried about what the next inflammatory politician is going to do. Uh, and I think we'd get a little bit more honest business if we were to improvise some sort of framework where there's regular check-ins. You're responsible for the mess you made, even if you can't predict it now. Instead of, oh, that well doesn't produce anymore, I'm going to go bankrupt and let the city clean it up. Yeah, no, I hear you. Any uh, final thoughts, comments, questions we should be contemplating for the future? I'll just say that it's a messy space, uh, but a fascinating one where I think everyone is thinking out loud and in the open. So an invitation to kind of keep doing that and asking questions and correcting each other and sharing those readings and ideas is really important. Um, and I think one of the most challenging aspects of, of policymaking around technology is that there is a pretty strong role for the companies to be at the table and that ends up creating a lot of discomfort and maybe that's something that we also just have to find a way to get over. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll see how that goes. And thanks so much, Jesse, for hosting and being so energizing and creating space for everyone's voice. I really admire how you do that. I have like homework to do and cool ideas to think about. Um, well, but thank you for bringing uh, a huge suitcase of cool ideas to this particular discussion and a fascinating range of case examples that for me, help substantiate kind of what we mean by responsible innovation. Because I kind of feel that what you and I both respectively do is we try to get ahead of these conversations. Like we collectively are having this conversation today in the end of January, but I can guarantee in March and April, you're going to see this conversation on TVO. Hopefully with VAST, but you never know with those folks at TVO. And But my point is, I think we are kind of ahead of the curve and I think we're anticipating Anticipating where this conversation is going to be as the technology companies negotiate with the Biden administration, as our friends in Europe start to continue to flex their muscles. So, Stro, I mean, by all means, take us out. If you want to open a new door, I can't guarantee we'll go there. No, but I, but I, by all means, I'm, I'm eager to hear from you. I, I'm well, well out of my depth talking about any of this uh, innovation stuff. Uh, but the one thing that is a takeaway for me is how can you not if you're innovative how can you be going into the situation being diabolical right responsibility should be at the core of why you're innovating and i don't understand how we can even be having this conversation in a way is you know it was just kind of a meta but that is the meta part right to your right. your early point about competition we were talking about later anyway vast you gotta go everyone thanks again another great session we'll be back next week until then Stay tuned.